Christ lived under life for us. Welcome to the club. It's going to be a raging fire with the breath of God breathing upon it. And as he beats them on that fire, an instrument shall raise up out of that fire. Spiritual, anointed, living truth. It's one thing to hear the word. It's another thing to be under the presence of God and to be on the fire of the Holy Ghost and to know that you know that the word that's coming forth is from the throne room. It is time to be a royal priesthood and a holy nation. It is time to be the sons and daughters of a living God. It's time for the roar of the lion to be restored in God's This is Revival for Christ Club, Winds of Fire Flags, Holy Fire. It's like a fire that's burning inside of me Your grace, it is the fire that's bringing me to my knees And every time I see, I can see Jesus breathe
Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Whatever's going on in your life today, you need to be rejoicing because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You've made it to Revival for Christ Club. Christ living, undivided bride, more than a ministry, more than a fellowship, all that and much, much more. We are bringing people together so that the revival of Jesus Christ can come alive in the body. And you're part of that body. God wants revival to come alive in you, alive in me, alive in Jenny. And together, we can set the world ablaze Ooh. with the word and spirit of a living God. Amen. And I want to share with you one of my scriptures today. This is in Hebrews 10, 23. And the word of God says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith yes. without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And I think of that, how we are not to be tossed to mm -hmm. and fro. We are not to wonder. We're not to be in doubt. We're not to waver. But the Bible says to hold fast. Hold fast. To hold fast. And I want to encourage you, hold on to the profession of your faith and grab the horns of the altar and do not let go. Let the Spirit of God speak and move out of you today. You know, Jenny, when we're on the water and we're holding fast, that means the anchor is taking hold. Yeah. And the anchor is not moving and the anchor is not uh, budging. And that's what we need to have in our relationship with God. The anchor of our soul, Jesus Christ, firmly planted into the Word and the Spirit of God. We need to become to a place where we realize we don't just need to sit around and say we're Christians. We don't just sit around and say we believe in something. We need to let our actions declare it. We need to let our speech declare it. We need to have uh, such an anchor in our soul and an anchor in the profession of our faith that we're not moved to abandon that faith for anything, that nothing can buy that faith from us. Let us not be like Esau, who for one morsel Amen. sold his birthright. Don't sell your birthright today. Be the vessels God has called you to be. Right now we're going to tell you a little bit about something special that's going on in the Yellow Rose Dinner Theater. It's called Motown. Oh, my friend, shut up. Don't punish me with brutality. Oh, talk to me. Oh, so you can. There are hills and mountains. Between us, always something to get up. Ooh, put those flat feet on the ground. Yeah. All right, let's close it out. Come on, choir, let's close it out. With a different meaning since you been gone. I want you to know today, I want you to know without a shadow of a doubt, I love you and I thank the Lord that God has brought us together and we've been able to stand together. You know, so many times I don't think we take that time to let the person that stood with us the most know how important they are to us. And to me, there's no one more important than Jennifer. And I love you, thank Jenny. You. Thank you for standing by. I, I, I was just me. saying today how grateful I am to have my best friend, my soulmate, mm -hmm. and that one that I know the Lord created yes. for me, and that every day we wake up, we can fight the devil yes. together. Amen. And not only that, proclaim the gospel and minister to the souls of men and women together. Amen. That's so part I, I love this. I love doing it together. <laughs> well, right now, we've got time to switch for our message today. This message was recorded live at Revival for Christ Club's International Headquarters in Moore, Oklahoma. Now, we're going to take you to this again. Please sit back and relax as we present Halloween, a masterful deception of evil, Just part like The devil goes, look, your people worship me. Your people don't love you. They love me. And all I got to get them to do is walk away from the truth. Walk away from the truth. Yeah. Because I got some candy. I got to dress up. Let me explain something to you. You want to have a costume party, have it any other day of the week except October 30th and October 31st. If you want to do that, fine. Enjoy. If you want to eat candy, go the day after Halloween and buy all the candy you want. Sugar those kids up. They'll be up for five days. Do that if you want to. But here's the thing about it. Make a stand once and for all. To make a stand and say, you know what, God? I reject all appearances of evil. I reject anything that looks like evil. It doesn't have to have evil in it. It just has to look like evil. And I'm walking away from it. I'm not going to be a part of it. Wouldn't it make sense to seek a holiday draped?
in such conspiracies and open blasphemy against God's mercy, love, and goodness. So how can we as true, faithful, honest, believing Christians justify and support in any way? What part of evil can good embrace and still be good? Think about that. What part of evil does it take to contaminate good? Maybe that's why God tells us, shun all appearances of evil. Don't even allow yourself to get wrapped up in that. We need a spiritual protest against this holiday, which so blatantly exalts and glorifies evil. We need to be equipped with spiritual knowledge to overcome this darkness with the light of our Lord and King and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, Those are my opening comments on this particular topic about Halloween. Now I'm going to Go to the next section in this, which is the origin of Halloween. You're going to realize where Halloween actually comes from. This is all fact. You can look it up and Google it right away. You know, say all this stuff some exact way. Here we go. Halloween origin. Halloween is generally celebrated on October 31st, preceding the Christian feast of Hallowmas or All Hallows or All Saints Day. However, the observation of Halloween has strong roots dating back over 2,000 years ago. It is most widely believed that Halloween, as we know it, originated from the, El the ancient Celts. Harvest festivals, particularly the Gaelic festival of Samhain, Lord of the Dead. I want you to think about that for a minute. It's a celebration that Samhain, or some call him Samhain, either way they're the same, Samhain, Samhain. They call him, this is, Halloween was originally a celebration to him, to Lord of the Dead. To glorify the Lord of the dead. Think about that for a minute. Samen, Satan, Samhain, Satan. He's not even trying to make it hard. He's not even trying to hide it from you. He says, yeah, man. And think about it. Who do we know is Lord of the dead? If God's the Lord of the living, what is the devil? Lord of the dead. So if he's Lord, so it's so blatant. It's a celebration of Lord of the dead. That's how it started. That's its origin. That's how it was birthed with that mentality and that attitude. Let's go on and look what it says. These European Celts occupied parts of Ireland and the United Kingdom and northern France. It was, lar it was a largely pagan festival dedicated to the dead, involving the offerings of large sacrifices of crops and animals. The Druids were the priest of the uh, of, the Celtic, of the Celtic nation, a religion, and carried out duties as priests, religious officials, but also as judges, sacrificers, teachers, and law keepers. They were most likely given charge of the Feast of Samhain and maintaining all the traditions associated with its celebration. The Celts had always believed in more than one God. When it comes to the human sacrifice... Sacrifice was also acceptable and preferred. The Greek historian, Dagorius Calais, asserts that a sacrifice acceptable to the Celtic gods had to be attended by a druid, for they were the intermediaries between the people and the divinities. He remarked upon the importance of prophets in the druid ritual. And here's what he says. These men predict the future by observing the flight and calls of birds and of the sacrifice of holy animals. All orders of society are in their power. And in very important matters, they prepare a human victim, plunging a dagger into his or her chest by observing the way his or her limbs convulse and he or her falls and the gushing of his blood or her blood. They are able This is where your holiday started. This is how it started. And you wonder why when we do devil busting services and we pray, why do we pray against omens? Why do we pray that everything in the, in the ceremony will fail? Because of these very things. They look for all these things to be a certain way. See, they look for omens. Omens have to be a certain way in order to present an acceptable sacrifice. And if the omens aren't, and you try to present a sacrifice, whatever you're doing or praying on will come back on you. 
That's how the devil does you. If you don't get it right, I'm going to get you. So you better get it right. <laughs> but think about it, man. Think about where this thing starts. Think about where the origin of this is. This guy says that the sacrifice is acceptable to the Druid gods. Both animal and human are being given there. Even the Roma, Roman emperor witnessed the sacrifice performed by the Druids. A form of sacrifices recorded by Caesar was the burning alive of victims in a, wo a large wooden effigy uh, now often known as the Wicker Man. And that's where it came from. It came from Celtic things. The reason the Wicker Man it's a deal that comes from Celtic uh, beliefs. is because it's made out of branches and limbs and parts of trees. They put together. Celts believed trees were gods. They worshipped the trees. They believed in the trees. They believed in the earth and life. And that's kind of where they got all their stuff. That's the one thing you'll find out a lot about Satan. Whenever Satan wants to make, try to put some legitimacy to a religion, he works on it being natural. Well, it's all natural. Everything's natural. We love the land. We love the water. We love the plants. Everything's natural, man. But did you just think about something when you think about that? Think about it for just a second. Everything's natural. Think about this now. Everything is natural. Everything is from the earth. Water, the dirt, the food, all the things God has blessed us with comes on this earth. Everything is natural, wholesome. They kill him. But now here's the thing now. That's all great, except for one thing. A question for you. Will the day come when that water fades? Will the day come when the food vanishes? Will the day come when the sun may not shine anymore? Will that day come? Then what good will it be that you're all on natural rest? Because you'll be dead. But let me tell you the one thing they don't talk about. The spiritual food. The food that you've got to have right here to change your life, to transform you, to bring you into a new relationship with God. They don't deal with the spiritual in that way because all their spiritual is connected to flesh because it is birthed through the fleshful lust of the enemy wanting to lift himself above God. Do you understand that? And here's the key. The devil doesn't want you to understand your spiritual inheritance. He doesn't want you to understand all the spiritual revelation and things of God because neither he nor any of his followers are going there. So why would he want to equip you with ability you'll never need anyway? You're not going to need that ability because you love your flesh too much. The devil's into loving the flesh because one thing the devil knows, if you love your flesh, he doesn't even have to be there. You'll just do it because you're full of flesh. You have to stand over. You don't even have to sign a demon to you. You'll mess up all on your own, all by yourself, just through the lust of your flesh. Think about this for a second, folks. Every single thing associated with these ceremonies and these ritualisms and stuff have to do with the earth. But not this earth. This earth. You know why? Because the devil knows he, he, this earth, his earth ain't going where ours is going. See, God wants you to start thinking spiritual. See, this is the thing. The devil wants them to focus on the earth and on the elements of the earth and all this natural and earth stuff because they're not going nowhere else. I glorify the earth. He's not gonna, he doesn't really want to open the deal. Hey, you guys are going to get to burn with me in hell for a year. He doesn't want to lay that out there. But here's the thing that's amazing. Everything with God is based on spiritual. Think about it. Everything with God is based on passing through. We're not staying here. We're not looking for a long lease. We're not staying here. We're passing through to a better land. We're going to a greater country. We're going to go where the spirit and the anointing of God flows all the time, where the presence of God is in that place. And that's why you look at this and say, this holiday has nothing to do with supernatural spiritual glorification of God. It glorifies the devil. And it causes you to look on everything physical. Wow, it is clear to see this holiday is connected to such innocence. How could we ever see any evil in it at all? Amazing how blind the desires of our flesh can make us. One of the most effective methods Satan uses against believers is to get you to believe that he is not real. To make you think that anyone sounding a spiritual alarm is a fool or overreacting. 
See, here's the thing the devil loves to do. He wants you, he wants to do everything he can to make you sound foolish and stupid so nobody will listen to you. And he does such outlandish things that when you begin to expose them or talk about them, nobody believes you. Because they're so outlandish. Surely that couldn't, surely not. Surely no. Well, I think as we're learning in 2020, surely yes. Surely yes on every side of me. Just because you want to pretend it ain't there don't mean it's not there. It is there, you know. Do we have problems in our country with racism, justice, and all those things? Yes, we absolutely do. And we need to fix them, and there needs to be solutions, real, a valid, serious solutions to solve them. But not burning stuff down, rioting, beating people up, killing them, expecting people to bow to us. That is not God. That is all flesh. You know, you're a royal priest in a holy nation. Why are you wasting your time on dirt of this land? And you could be walking in the meat of the gospel. I want the meat, baby. Let's go on. The denial of the facts maintain his ability to manipulate and control you through spiritual ignorance. Man, I like that. That's true. When you deny what the facts are, when you deny the spiritual knowledge and wisdom of the facts, it maintains the ability for you to be manipulated and controlled through your blind ignorance to Satan. Practicing Druid priests believe that Samhain was a, was a limited time when the boundless between the world and the other world could be more closely, more easily crossed. They believe during this time the doorways could be opened, allowing supernatural beings and the souls of the dead to come into our world. And this is what they actually believe. They believe on October 30th and 31st that the veil between this world and the world of the dead is the thinnest that it can ever be. And at that point, if you do the right ceremonies, do the right services, do the right celebrations, you can speak to the dead in that other world. Sometimes you can urge and encourage them to come here. Sometimes you can open yourself up to be possessed by demons or spirit. This is also a form of celebration. Let's go on. Okay. They believe the spirits of the dead revisited their earthly homes on the evening. And there are multiple stories about this ancient evil holiday. One tale from the book of invasions tells about how each, how each Samhain, the people of Nemed, had to give two-thirds of their children, their corn, and their milk to the harmful and destructive powers of nature. So they made sacrifices. So they'd have good crops. They'd make sacrifices so the storms wouldn't come upon them. They'd make sacrifices so pestilence wouldn't come upon them. And how serious the situation was, a lot of times depended on the severity of the sacrifice. And on whether it's human, animal, plant, whatever. They had a different sacrifice for everything, depending on what they considered to be the threat, the situation, or the problem goes on and says, um, according to the annals of the four masters, which were written by Christian monks, Samhain in ancient Ireland was associated with a god or idol called Crom Krosh. The text claimed the firstborn child would be sacrificed at the stone idol of Crom Krosh. King Tyramus and three-fourths three -fourths of his people died while worshiping Krom Kroch, their one sound. So it said, if you look what it says there, it said they believe that you should take the firstborn child and sacrifice him to Krom. And they, he said he lost three-fourths of his people during one sound. That's how many people got killed, how many people died. Lord of the dead, worshiping the dead, human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, passing from this world to the next. Hmm. Sounds like a holiday God would clearly want his people to embrace and celebrate, right? Let's look at those facts again. Lord of the dead, worshiping the dead, human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, passing from this world to the next. Please indicate to me and show me one scripture that even vaguely supports that as being okay. That you can worship the Lord of the dead, glorify death over life, Prefer human sacrifice and animal sacrifice 
am passing from this world to the world of the dead. But speaking to the dead and pulling some of the dead back. Samhain, Lord of dead. Satan, Lord of the dead, master of death. Samhain calling forth spirits from other worlds. Satan calling forth demons and spirits. Sounds like we should instantly know whose holiday this is. Doesn't it? Salmon requiring a human sacrifice of the firstborn child. Why? Why does he require it? Why did he want that? We have two accounts in the word of God when leaders motivated by Satan demanded the death of the Hebrew children to exalt their own kingdoms. Pharaoh, when Moses was the deliverer of his people, was born in Exodus chapter 1, verse 22. He orders all male Hebrew children to be thrown into the Nile. Later, the last plague upon Egypt is the death of all the firstborn, Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. When Jesus, the deliverer of his people, was born, according to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 18, King Herod ordered all Jewish children to be killed so that he might stop his throne from being taken by the new king. The requirement of the death of a firstborn is for what purpose, people? Why did the devil pick that? Why is that his big thing he wants? Huh? Nope. Close, though. Here's what it is. It is a blasphemy move by the enemy to mock God's sacrifice of his firstborn son, which is Jesus Christ. Do you see that? That's why the devil requires firstborn kids, because he's trying to blaspheme trying to blaspheme Jesus, trying to blaspheme God and God's sacrifice for his people. Satan, wanting to consider himself a God, requires this action to appease his own deluded ego. That's why he does. It's crystal clear to see that Satan masked himself as Alwyn and used uh, nature to confuse them about who they were and really giving tribute to. However, I believe the worship of any God, period, is forbidden by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great I Am. Our Heavenly Father God. I believe the Word of God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 through 5. Right? Ask yourself these quick questions without looking to justify your answers. I'm about to ask you some questions. I want to ask each one, but don't use justification. Just listen and answer it. As Bible-believing Christian, should I at any time glorify death? I can't hear you. What? I can't hear you. What? Should I worship the Lord of death? Should I stand quietly by and pretend this is not real? Should I ever support a holiday which freely supports witchcraft? Should I blindly ignore the seriousness of a holiday born in Druid custom? Would I attend a birthday for Satan because the cake was good? Come on, wouldn't you? I'm not really here for his birthday. I just came for cake. <laughs> That's right. I won't dress scary. How did Satan... Oh, first of all, if you answered no to any of the above questions, then simply put, you should not celebrate Halloween. Okay. Okay. So, how did Satan remask this clearly evil holiday and sell it to those who claim Christ is king? As the Catholic missionaries swarmed Britain and Ireland, seeking the mass conversion to Catholicism, their orders from Pope Gregory in 601 A.D. was to cunningly convert the Druid rituals into Catholic ceremonies. As Catholics converted the ritual of Samhain into the festival of All Saints Day. A day of celebration and prayer to dead saints. They slapped some lipstick on it, but it was still a pig. Doesn't matter. You can slap lipstick on, still gonna kiss a pig, all right? That's what this was. He told him, he said, listen, man. We got this thing going here. Uh, Pope Gregory says, we'll get it all switched over. We'll just we'll get them all to realize that, hey, these are Christian holidays. 
You can still do your parties and your ceremony, but now you'll be doing it for Christ. So look what he said. The Catholics converted the ritual of Samhain into the festival of All Saints Day, a celebration of prayer to dead saints. These grand and glorious pagan celebrations were assimilated by the Catholic Church. Rather than extinguish old customs, the church leaders provide Christian versions of them. From the Middle Ages on All Saints Day and All Souls Day, replace the ancient uh, Celtic celebrations of the dead. An American holiday in American history. New York, 1990, that's where that came from, that little quote there. It says, rather than extinguish old customs, the church leaders provided Christian versions of them. From the Middle Ages on, All Saints Day and All Souls Day replaced the ancient Celtic celebration of the dead. And that was uh, in a book called The American History of Halloween. Okay. They tried to paint over it. The evil it was birthed with may have put a new suit of clothes on it, but its original purpose and celebration continued. And this is the part that you can find very easy. And you know why? As Christians, why are we just asking ourselves this question? It is the highest witch's Shabbat. It's one of the most significant days practiced by Satanists. And still, on this day, ceremonies and sacrifices are made for power and supernatural contact, which rebels against the word and the spirit of our God. Maybe so, but I just don't celebrate it for those reasons. So I'm clean from it. Really, you can really say that. You don't oppose it. You don't protest it in prayer and supplication to God. You don't counter it with praise and worship. You agree with it, worried that someone will persecute you for avoiding this holiday with your refusal to participate. Okay. Satan's considered this one of the highest recruiting days for those who want to test the water in the worship to Satan. Satan High Priestess Blanche Barton of the Church of Satan's website praises Halloween in this way. This is on a Satanist website. It Halloween gives them the most mon- gives the most mundane people the opportunity to taste wickedness for one night. They have a chance to dance with the devil. I see Satanists all over the world meeting in small groups this night. And Halloween's 500 years hence to raise a glass to the infernal host. The satanic calendar degrees for Halloween, one of the two most important nights of year. Blood and sexual rituals, sexual association with demons, animals and human sacrifice, both male and female. But it's okay. I don't care how others look at it or celebrate it. I don't, so I'm okay. You really think that will be the answer that you want to give God when he says, why did you know to do good and you chose not to do it? You chose to do evil anyway. Almost every tradition associated with this holiday has its roots in evil. We will closely examine many of these seemingly harmless traditions and unmask them for the truth. If what I shared with you already doesn't have you becoming more concerned about this holiday, we might need to look to Scripture for some important spiritual guidance to help us out. We must avoid the conceited boasting of the flesh, thinking that what we do and how we do it is somehow our own decision. We are subject to the will of God. To know to do good and do it not is sin. And the wages of sin are what? Job 28 and 28 says, And unto men he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord is what? Wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. When you get the sense to walk away from evil, when you can walk away from those things, and say, man, I'm not going to participate in that because of the evil that's associated with it. That means you have understanding to determine what is evil. And that's why I say it's so important just to realize and to know that even the appearance of evil, you're supposed to walk away from. This is James 4 and 13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what it shall be on the morrow, or what is your life. 
for it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then it vanisheth away. For what you ought to say is, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth not to him it is sin. And there's something interesting to see here. He says, for what we ought to say is, if the Lord will, we will live, and we'll do this, we'll do that. And in the Amplified it says, but you ought to instead say, if the Lord is willing, you shall live, and you shall do this thing and that thing. But as it is, you boast falsely in your presumption and your self-conceit. All such boasting is wrong. And I ask you to take a look at this. For me to receive the facts of the Word of God that says, shun all of appearances of evil. For me to read such facts, it says to know to do good and do it not, is sin. To go through all this that we've just gone through in the first few minutes of this class and to boast that I can still do Halloween anyway because I'm justified? Are you not conceited with your own thoughts? Are you not conceited with your own understanding? Think about that, people. I can stand up and say, I don't care what the facts say. I don't care that, it or, uh, that the origin was uh, Lord of the dead. I don't care they worship evil spirits. I don't care they kill humans. I don't care they kill animals. I don't care about all that. I can celebrate it because I don't do it for those reasons because I'm God. That's conceit. That's boastful. What the answer probably should be should be more along the lines of this. Lord, this does not glorify. Lord, this does not exalt you. Lord, this exalts fear, terror, horror. It has origins in the devil. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Not because I can't if I choose to, but because it's wrong. Because it would stumble my faith. Lord, I'm not going to do that. It would be glorifying something contrary to what I've dedicated my life to, which is serving and being obedient to the Lord. Okay? Paul, in his letter at Thessalonia, provides us with some very powerful insight to the attitude of a Christian should have concerning our Christian behavior, attitude, and demonstration in our actions. That's 1 Thessalonians. Go ahead and get those. 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and which are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love, for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exalt you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and be patient towards all men. See that none render what? We're not to render evil for what? Unto any man. Not to any man. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to what? To all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning Christ Jesus your Lord. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things. Do you know what he's saying about that? Make sure it's my will. Make sure my word supports it. Make sure my Spirit is guiding you and leading you in that direction. Make sure God's anointing and presence is on you. Amen? Prove all things. Make sure it's scripturally sound, spiritually sound, experience sound. You've experienced those spiritual things in God. Go and look what it says. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. And here's the one I like. Abstain. This is the second appearance of it. Two appearances in the New Testament. This one here and there's one I think in Corinthians. Anyway, there it is. Abstain from what? From what? All appearances of evil. It doesn't even have to look like, it doesn't have to be evil. It just has to appear to be evil. And you need to be away from it. It goes on and says, And to the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray to God your whole, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, and he will also do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you unto the Lord that this epistle should be read uh, unto all the holy brethren. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, what you're going to find out there is what he's talking about. 
He's talking about a whole different set of spiritual actions than a Christian would be applying if they were embracing and holding to or justifying and trying to make an excuse for Halloween. Look what it says here. He says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to what? He tells you to follow that which is what? That which is what? That which is what? That which is what? Is evil good? No. I'm sorry, is evil good? Is evil good? What word better defines Halloween? Good or evil? Good or evil? Does Halloween support peace between brothers? Does Halloween support a relationship between you and your Heavenly Father? Does Halloween support you bringing your flesh under subjection and yielding yourself to the Spirit of God? So since it is not good, why would you justify an action to follow evil? Why would you do that? Why would that be the reason you do that, right? Okay, so let's talk about it. Let's talk about this first part, the origin of Halloween. Questions, comments, statements, go Jack. Okay, so you were talking about how um, how they portray this, that it's all natural, when mm -hmm. they're talking about witchcraft and stuff like that, yeah. and, and everything's natural. Well, if you, if you get into Wicca, Wicca deals a lot with the earth, you know, everything's, na they have a lot of natural herbs and things like that they go into. Mother Earth. Right. Helping, you know. Go ahead. Right, and they're demigods or whatever. Right, they Mother Earth. Does right. Things. Um, so I was thinking about that and what come to my remembrance is that in the Garden of Eden, we were walking in a spiritual place, yes, yeah. but the devil came and convinced Eve to take, take in the fruit of right. good and evil, mm -hmm. which automatically kicked them out of the garden into the natural. Which actually, you know, you, you hear that and it's called the fruit of good and evil, but I didn't see any good come out of that. Fruit. No. So what was it really she It was evil. It. And the thing was, once she was, once she acknowledged and received evil, then she knew what good was. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So really, he just gave her evil. Which is which But is she what took a bite of it and, and it let her acknowledge that she wasn't good. <laughs> which is what they're doing with yeah. Halloween. Huh? They're trying to get Christians to do oh, that yeah. with Halloween exactly. so they'll yeah. be kicked out of the spiritual. Exactly, yeah. And be locked into the natural. Absolutely, that is correct. Yeah, yeah see, the thing, they, the thing is, you got to realize... For Satan and his kingdom, and for all his people, for us to battle on the physical battlefield is a plus. That's why all this crap's going on right now. Because he wants us fighting that physical battle. He wants us on that physical battlefield. Because if we're on the physical battlefield, we'll never win. The only way we're going to win is on the spiritual battlefield. That's the only way. And he wants you off that spiritual battlefield. He definitely wants you off of it October 30th. So he can do what he wants. Good deal. Good question. Anybody else? Yes. Okay, sir. So what would you say to people, pastors and so on, right. that create this event within their church walls and call it something cute like Chunk or Treat? What is the accountability for the people that they are leading into this? Well, I think as far as accountability is concerned, that has nothing to do with me. The accountability has to do with God. God's already said it. To know to do good and do it not is sin. So you're going to have to deal with an unforgiven sin when you do something like that. I think the one thing I'll say to pastors, ministers, preachers around the world, stop and ask yourself some very, very important questions. And when you get the answers to those questions, make a determination on what you think you want to do after some real serious time in prayer and consideration with God. Here's some of the questions I would ask them. Is Halloween no for joy, peace, good, will for all, or not? Does Halloween get its origins from ancient customs like the Feast of Samhain, Lord of the Dead. Is Halloween considered to be one of the two most satanic holidays in the world? Is Halloween considered one of Wicca's, the witch's greatest Sabbath? Will there be an evil occult ritual on this night? Yes. Every one of those answers is yes, 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 yes. Can you say praise the Lord? And just to tell you, this is from a witch named Doreen Valentine. 
Halloween is one of the four great Sabbaths of the witches that everyone has heard about. To witches, Halloween is a serious occasion. However, merrily celebrated. It is an old Celtic eve of Samhain. Uh, with the coming of Christianity, the church tried to crystal, uh, Christianize the old festival by making it 1st November All Saints Day. Or All Hallows, as the old term was. The Samhain Eve became All Hallows Eve, or Halloween. But attempts to discourage the pagan celebration were so unavailing that the fest festival was eventually banned from the church calendar. It was not until 1928 when the Church of England formally restored All Hallows to its calendar, on the assumption that the old pagan associations of Halloween uh, were at last really dead and forgotten, a supposition that was certainly premature. Can you say praise God? So I would ask a minister to go through those questions I just asked. And if you say yes to any of those questions, then you're falling down on the side of evil. You're falling down on side side that glorifies Satan. How can you justify that before God? How can you do it? Well, we don't celebrate that way. It doesn't matter whether you do or not. They do. They celebrate it that way. And you don't do anything to oppose them. The whole plan that I got to battle the enemy came from those seven people that night. As they were there talking and we would ask questions and people would call in. And they said, what should we do on this night? I, we get what you're saying, don't celebrate it, but what should we do on this night? And I want you to know, there was one guy there who was a warlock, and he was one of the most aggressive ones on it. He said, no, man. He said, I don't care if you call it trunk or treat. I don't care if you call it disciples night. I don't care what you call it. You are celebrating. And he said, if you're doing anything other than opposition, you fail. You fail. You should do nothing other than opposition. Nothing other than opposition. He said when they took Jesus to the cross, what we do? Go have a little party that night? And there's a good party because we all got to eat candy, but Jesus is up there dying on the cross. He said, come on, man, it's time to wake up. We are not on the side of Satan. We are on the side of God. We are not on the wrong side. We're on the right side. The Bible says, be ye hot or be ye cold, for if you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. I don't know what part of shun all appearances of evil does not apply to this holiday. I do not know what parts of it do not apply to it. Or any holiday that does not exalt and lift up God. Any holiday that's focus and attention is not on the Lord. You know, it's something we need to think about. Something we need to really consider. But one thing, this holiday is very... The thing about it is, like for example, a lot, almost every holiday is based on some pagan equinox or some pagan solstice and equinox. They're based on some kind of solstice or equinox, every single one of them. Because they took them from pagan holidays. Okay? But, that doesn't, but the thing is, of all of them, the only one that is just one, there's no, you can't redeem this holiday. There's nothing redeeming from it except the billion dollars people put in their pockets. I mean, come on, think about it. You want to, well, I'm not going to probably get to that tonight, but when I get to the point of what a jack o' lantern means, you're going to think, oh my gosh, I'm putting jack o' lantern. I'll just tell you real quick, and I'll go, you know, a jack o' lantern, when you put a jack o' lantern on your front porch, it means you sacrifice to Satan. Did you know that? That is the symbol that you have sacrificed to the devil. And there is now demonic spirit on your porch. Protecting your home. That's what that jack o' lantern is supposed to be. You think about it. They take a pumpkin. A very nice, very good pumpkin. They core out the center. Of it, take the meat out. Take the value out of it. Take the good stuff out of it. Take the seeds and life out of it so they can make it a dead gourd. And then what do they do? They put an evil face on it. They give it an expression. And then they stick a candle down in it. A false light to make it look alive when it's not. What's the devil want to do to you? He wants to core you. He wants to take every bit of value and substance out of you. He, want to take, he wants to take the word of God that's been a seed for your life and pull it out of you. He doesn't want you to have life. And then when he gets you to the state where you're dead and he's got the life out of you, 
You're no longer influenced by the Spirit. You're no longer moved by the Word of God. All those things have become dead to you because He's desensified you to them. Then He will take a false lie and go, now you look alive, but you're not. And let's see, what faith do I want you to show the world? I'll put the expression on your face. So that's why the Bible says, come to the Lord open face, without expression. Let God fill you with his expression. Amen? So see, that's, that's the jack o lantern So I mean, you see kids carrying them. People got them on their doors. People got them everywhere. And don't realize that's an ancient tradition of sacrifice to Satan. Ancient. It's been done for centuries. And there's a lot of other evil things that are done with those things too. I think there's some things, I can't think of what the brother's name is now. That one brother that talks about a lot, he's got... The Hispanic. Yes. See, if you're going to get dressed for battle, you got to get delivered. <laughs> you got to get retained. You got to get established in spiritual soundness of a mind of state of deliverance. Then you freely operate in righteousness. He said, when I deliver, hey, I'm not delivering for your carnality. I'm not delivering for your flesh. He said, when I deliver, it is to establish the kingdom of God in the hearts of men and women. To establish and bring forth an inside. Every distraction, every hindrance that is hindering you from the plan and the excellency that God wants to bring in your life, you must be set free from that. You must be delivered from that. You must say, God, if there's anything that's hindering me from moving into excellency, if you've got the Father, if you've got the Son, if you've got the Holy Ghost, then you've got the image, the nature, the character, and the personality of Jesus Christ. Blessed to introduce today D Hill with the blood. I am so thankful for the blood that Jesus shed. The blood that Jesus shed for me. That gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. You know what? It soothes my worries and it calms my fears. His precious blood dries all my tears. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Cause it reaches to the highest mountains And it flows through the lowest valley Oh, the blood that gives me strength from death to To the highest mountains And it flows to the Lord 
words found these Oh, the blood that gives me strength From day to day It will never lose its power Lord, you never lose its power. You will never lose its power. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Now, remember, if you need a prayer request, you need someone to talk with, someone to counsel with, or someone to pray with, the numbers are appearing in front of your screen right now. Numbers where you can contact us and call us, or numbers where you can get us on the social media platforms and the Internet. If you need a prayer or you need counseling, we are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to minister and pray with you a prayer of faith. So give us a call, and we'll pray with you. Uh, now, Jenny, we've got uh, two great uh, YouTube channels. Yes, be sure to check us out, RFC International Ministries or the Flame YouTube channel. Like, comment, subscribe, and share. And that's the best way you can help us. Thank you again so much for tuning into Revival for Christ today. We want to remind you, more than anything else, remember this, Satan, <laughs> you are defeated, and, and Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Lord. And, and it, it couldn't be any, any other, other way. way. <laughs> All right. We hope to see you next week at the same time, every Monday and Thursday, right here at the same time, on the Mighty Sea Fan, Christ Family Apostolic Network, when Jenny and I know our God has something awesome for, for you. That's a wrap. <laughs> That's a wrap. God bless. See you next time. My name is Ryan Colley. I'm the Administrative Vice President and International Evangelist of Revival for Christ Club International Ministries. We'd like to thank you so much for tuning into our program today. And if you would like to ignite the flame in your area, we would love to bring the love of Jesus to you. All you got to do is reach out to us by phone at 405-793-1777. You can also reach out to us on Facebook by direct message at Revival for Christ Club International Ministries or on YouTube. Also, if you would like to help us spread the flame around the world, you can do it in so many different ways. First off, you can do it through our cash app. That's RFC Roar. That's money sign RFC R O. A -R. Also, you can do credit card by phone at 405-793-1777. Now, once again, that's 405-793-1777. And finally, you can mail your support to 1005 Southwest 4th Street, Moore, Oklahoma, 73160. Once again, we'd like to thank everybody for tuning into our program today. Remember, we are a ministry with a vision built on a plan, the Word of God.